Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. Very much welcome to the third Christ College lecture. There's a historical coincidence I just learned. 95 years ago, Professor um, David Smith Cairns gave his first opening lecture, Christ College opening lecture, um, on the theme of theology and life. And many of you will know of or even remember Professor Cairns. Now, tonight we have in our midst Professor Tom Gregson. It's a real pleasure to introduce him to you. Um, and he will speak on a quite similar topic Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is theology and how should we do it? Professor um, Tom Gregson uh, holds the Marshall Chair in Divinity here at the University of Aberdeen. In, um, I can say an awful lot about him. I can say that he is author of several books, author of more than 50 articles and book chapters. I can say that he is currently on a British Academy midterm career um, a fellowship, and he is writing a three volume uh, Protestant ecclesiology. I really look forward to that one, Tom. <laughs> and he's working on, uh, currently on, this, on, the, on the first volume of that. I can say an awful lot more about Tom how great person he is, not only academically, but his hospitality together with his wife, Heather, is just amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, there is so much to say about Tom. I won't do that because you came here not to listen to me introducing Tom. You came here for Tom's lecture on being transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is theology and how should we do it? Two fundamental quite basic but very foundational questions for theology. Tom, I really look forward on your guidance, how we should do theology. That's quite a topic. Um, for those who wonder about the time, we try to finish around seven. So Tom will talk for about 50 minutes and we have some time uh, for questions uh, from you and then we'll finish seven, a little bit after seven. Tom, welcome, the floor is yours. Thanks, Leon. It's very good to be here with you all. I learned early on in my academic career that no academic ever writes a paper or gives a lecture that only has one title. Uh, invariably, there's always a colon, a slightly different title as the subtitle, and then if you're really pushing the boat out, you add a third level of titling, a sub-subtitle, which probably reveals more about the paper than anything else. I also learned quite early on that when academics have a title and a subtitle and then a semicolon and the word or and a completely different title altogether, it normally means that they've run out of time in preparing the paper they intended to give and have instead given a paper that they've had in the bag uh, that they're trying to pass off on a similar theme. So it may well be that the third level of my title is the most relevant today, a particularly Methodist view. It is said that Karl Barth, the theological mountain of the 20th century that cannot be avoided, once said to an English Methodist student, were an English theologian a rare enough thing, a Methodist theologian is altogether unheard of. Barth may well have been correct. One leading Methodist recently informed me that doctrine isn't a particularly meaningful term for Methodists who should think of themselves instead as pragmatic theologians, somebody who teaches Christian doctrine. That was certainly me told. And yet, John Wesley was himself a theology tutor at the University of Oxford and was engaged in a range of theological and doctrinal controversies. And the lineage of his thought can be traced from the evangelical revival of the 18th century, not only to the Methodist churches that exist today, but the variety of holiness denominations that can be found around the world. What is more, the distinctively Wesleyan theological approach, the quadrilateral of sources, where authority for theological statements is taken from scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, is one which is accepted and taught in almost all introductory courses to theology and introductory theological textbooks, though often without any reference or recognition of its particularly Methodist origins. 
To respond to this situation and condition in this lecture, I would like to give a theological account of the task and method of theology in a constructive and systematic way from a particularly Methodist perspective. I guess this really ought to be one of two lectures in some senses. Because it's a Christ College lecture, my concern primarily uh, relates to the way in which theology and the church might be thought of together. And I think there'd need to be an accompanying lecture as well about the relationship between theology and the university, although inevitably there is a good degree of overlap. The paper does so firstly, addresses this topic firstly by locating the task of theology in the doctrine of sanctification. Theology arises from the renewing of the mind and takes place in the transformation of the believer, which begins de facto in this life and continues throughout eternity, as the believer is, in the words of Charles Wesley, changed from glory into glory as she journeys into the infinity of the divine life. Having tried to establish this whence and whither of theology, the lecture turns to consider the sources of theology. And so in a second section of the lecture, therefore, the four classical Methodist sources of theology, the quadrilateral of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, are identified in terms of Wesley's use of them and the impetus Wesley's approach provides for contemporary theological discourse. Given the, what I expect, is a slightly more reformed context in which I am speaking and my desire not to cast pearls before swine, I have edited down a significant amount of the Wesley in the lecture, and we'll just give you some edited highlights. But key to this description of the four sources is the idea that for Wesley, each of these is an interrelated concept, which does not exist independently as a source of authority, except always in relation to the other three. The third section of the lecture moves from sources to consider more directly the question of method and how these sources can be thought about, seeking to orientate the theological task away from identification of four components of the quadrilateral towards a description of theological method as an enactment of, and this is going to be an important aspect of the lecture, ongoing fractal hierarchies of relationality in relation to the sources and loci of theology. Let me say that again. Ongoing fractal shifting hierarchies of relationality in relation to the sources and loci of theology as they are arranged in manifold relation to each other. This section seeks to account for systematicity in theology by identifying systematicity as an attempt at expression of the God who is one and who in oneness lives in dynamic and superabundant relationality which requires in the creaturely realm a coherent description of God and God's ways with the world. In this attempt at coherence in relation to the oneness of God, there will be an attempt to articulate what I call the non-competitive and non-prohibitive systematicity of theology. Now, if you're already lost by the incoherence of that sketch of where the lecture is going, you'll be glad to know that there are at least a few entertaining slides along the way, which hopefully will stop you from nodding off at this late hour in the evening. So, section one, the whence and whither of the theological task. Um, sanctification as the location for theology. From a Methodist perspective, an account of the task and method of theology, I want to say, is a properly theological topic to consider whether the human creature can think about God and God's ways with the world rests in material theological discourse rather than necessarily in independent and pre-theological heuristics and foundations. I'd want to say that it is not even indeed theology's public relevance, which is the reason for the theological enterprise. Its ecclesial functionality has further, to my mind, only a secondary and dependent relationship to theology's more primary purpose. Theology does not exist at its most foundational level, note the at its most foundational level, level either for the sake of relevance to the world or for the sake of the upbuilding of the community of faith. Instead, I want to say that theology is an activity which arises from the commandment to love God with our minds. And that's my tackiest and most distasteful slide of the evening. Theology's primary locus rests in the active loving of the God who first 
loved the creature. And theology is thereby a graced response to grace, an account of what God has done and is doing for and in creation from those who recognize the work of God in that theater. In this way, Methodist understandings of theology may be, it is in this way that Methodist understandings of theology may be articulated as an expression of the work of divine grace, as grace transforms and illuminates the mind, which freely responds as a sanctified intellectum in endeavoring to love the God who first and graciously loved creation. For Methodist theology, the very existence of theology is best located in theological topography under the theological locus of sanctification and more narrowly, the de facto sanctification the Spirit effects in the life of the believer in space and time, as the believer is freed freely to love the God who loved her with her mind. I sometimes, within the course of lectures, try to describe this in terms of the idea of swimming with a tide. Um, Sanctification, it strikes me, is something which primarily is done to the creature by God in redemption, but within which the creature participates. If you imagine a situation of a tide breaking upon you, you have the choice of trying to swim uh, along with the tide. If you're swimming along with the tide, you are swimming, you are moving. There's a sense of direction, a sense of human willing that's taking place, but you're generally being carried along by the, sli- by the tide. Of course, the other option is the sort of situation that I find myself in at the beach where you think you can swim along with the tide and actually what ends up happening is you stand against it in some way and get washed up coughing and spluttering uh, on the shore. It seems to me that sanctification is a way of trying to express the movement of the creature within the movements of God and divine grace. If theology is understood, however, as a loving of God with the mind, it seems to me that the question inevitably arises of how we are to speak of the reason that the mind exercises in its love of God. Where is reason to be located theologically and where properly do the mind and its reason belong in relation to the theological task? Karl Barth was once asked what the place of reason was within his theology. His typically humorous and robust response was simply this, I use it. And there's a bit of me that's tempted to say that. But how are we to describe that activity of reasoning theologically? Is reason to be understood as that unique faculty which human beings alone possess? Is it the inquiry into God and God's ways with the world simply by way of application of the human cognitive faculties to the topic of divine things? Is theology a science which investigates the divine object and its effects in the same way as any science investigates the world? Or is it a science which arises from a created human capacity to think, which is then applied to God and God's ways with the world? And if it is any of these things, how is it that we as theologians use it? Well, very briefly, it seems to me that traditionally theology has thought about this question in two distinct ways. One way of responding to this set of questions is to say that the rational intellect has the capacity to reason uh, as a fitting component of its own creatureliness, that God creates the mind and creates the mind as a fitting uh, locus with which to think about divine things. In that sense, what we can say is that reason belongs somehow to the doctrine of creation. The other way to think of it is to think about reason as belonging somehow to the doctrine of redemption, that God, through God's revelation and through God's redemption, enables the intellect to do that which it cannot do, to contemplate divine things and to receive divine knowledge. But it seems to me that there are problems with both approaches. The first approach of locating reason reason theologically singularly within the fittingness of the mind, the capacity of the created human intellect, It seems to me raises questions about the place of the fallenness of the mind, the role of sin, the corrupted intellect, the capacity to address issues of divine things from the perspective of human finitude and limitation. Or else, the question of what we are to do in terms of theological anthropology of those who are differently abled, as somehow those who are able to contemplate high theological things, more human or better humans, than those who cannot? Are they more creaturely, in a sense, 
uh, that, that fittingness might demand. And whether in the end as well, what we establish by locating the mind as a fitting place with which to contemplate divine things, some kind of anknupfungspunkt, to use Brunner's term, some kind of place of human contact uh, where the creature has a capacity to think about God aside from God and from God's gracious movement. But it seems to me, on the other side, there are equal and opposite problems as well to be addressed. That if we are to locate the capacity to think theologically within redemption, in some kind of God-given capacity which is given to uh, the believer, almost like it might be a microchip or something added into your mind, with the capacity to think theologically and with theological data, then it seems to me that we've got questions to ask about whether theology might contain some kind of secret Gnostic knowledge that we have to possess in order to progress further in the faith. And, and what place is there then for human involvement or for creaturely integrity? What about the critical task of theology, the responsibility that the theologian has to think critically about received traditions and modes of thought? And is there a danger as well that the theologian begins to claim too much of her authority in relation to a sense of excessive confidence in theology because somehow theology is this God-given set of information from redemption? I want to ask, therefore, whether there is a way of understanding the role of the human mind's active engagement in the task of theology in such a way as to protect creaturely integrity and the creaturely integrity of theology without that account resting so much on the place of extant creaturely reason and the created capacity of the lapsed creature that the reconciling and redeeming work of God seems an added and perhaps unnecessary extra to the knowledge and knowing that human beings possess and are already capable of, unaided by divine grace? Is there a way of accounting for this creaturely integrity in the pursuit of theology at the same time as understanding the reconciling and redeeming work of God as essential not only to the uh, condition of receiving salvation and reconciliation, but as essential also to contemplating and reflecting upon it, of being capable to learn divine things. I want to say that it's in this context that a Methodist account of an emphasis upon sanctification might actually prove helpful. And in this way, understanding the theological race of the task and method of theology as resting within the doctrine of sanctification is appropriate for attempting to preserve both divine agency without undermining the limits of theology as a creaturely exercise and human integrity without a direct understanding that a person with more worldly intelligence is necessarily a better theologian or perhaps more pertinently a better disciple? Is there a way of trying to hold both of those sets of ideas together within the doctrine of sanctification with regard to the task of theology? Well, as a task of attempting to love God with our minds, theology finds its existence as resting within an account of the regenerate Christian life. Moved by grace, we might want to say, the believer freely moves within the grace that moves her. In the movement of grace towards and within creation, the human creature is in the process of being caught up by God's work through his spirit of regeneration. In this being caught up, the human mind, in its createdness, its limits, its fallenness, its creaturely integrity, is also in the process of being renewed. As the creature in toto, so the mind specifically is moved by God and moved towards God. In order that that mind is able to move and to move towards the God who has moved towards it. Um, I should probably stay on a slight aside here. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I am very influenced in this way of thinking by a particular American, North American pragmatic theory that rather than thinking about logic in terms of deduction and induction, uh, I'm particularly attracted by ideas of logic relating to abduction. There's quite a lot in the footnotes about this. It's an idea that we see in people like Charles Sanders Pierce. It's picked up by people like Peter Oakes in the US, but we also see it as well in Coleridge. Uh, Coleridge is somebody who, in his own writing, spent a long time trying to describe this notion of abductive logics, moving within movement, we might say, or moving as we are moved. <clears throat> 
The justified human, including her mind, exists not only in a state of being, the justified human exists in a state of activity in which she is made and is being made righteous in God's act of sanctification. In this act of the human becoming just and righteous, God enables the human to progress in sanctification and to be conformed more and more to the likeness of Christ. Sin remains within the believer, as does creaturely integrity and the creaturely limits of creation, but moved by grace and moving within grace, in the words of Wesley, the believer gradually dies to sin and grows in grace. In this growing in grace, the believer's whole being is enabled to share in the sanctifying and perfecting work of God as she increasingly has the same mind as was in Jesus Christ, to quote Philippians 2.5. As Wesley quotes in his sermon on the new birth, while a man, and I hope you'll forgive uh, the 18th century non-gender inclusive uh, language of Wesley here, while a man is in a mere natural state before he is born of God, he has in a spiritual sense eyes and sees not. A thick impenetrable veil lays upon them. He has ears but hears not. He is utterly deaf to what he is most of all concerned to hear. His other spiritual senses are all locked up. He is in the same condition as if he had them not. Hence, he has no knowledge of God, no intercourse with him. He is not acquainted with him. He has no true knowledge of the things of God, either spiritual or eternal things. But this very context for Wesley changes entirely in the state of being born again. Not quite, perhaps, what we mean by that term today. Being born again, Wesley sees, as a great work which God does in us, renewing the fallen nature in this work of renewal, there is, for Wesley, a symmetrical reciprocity. God breathes continually into the mind and soul of the regenerate, and the regenerate mind and soul prays to God. Grace is descending, writes Wesley, into the heart, and prayer and praise are ascending into heaven. For Wesley, growth in holiness, in which a believer must be actively engaged in faith, is a growth that he describes as being into the whole mind which was in Christ Jesus. This transformation of the mind is a thankful and loving response to the God who has first loved the creature. Critically for Wesley, and perhaps this is the distinctively Methodist component, this work of God is not only completed de jure in the believer's coming to faith, Growth, as the concept implies for Wesley, is ongoing throughout the believer's life de facto. Sanctification begins in coming to faith, but it continues throughout the life of faith to transform the creature in time into a creature which has the same mind as is in Jesus Christ. There is awakened within the creature a new and regenerate mind illuminated by the love and truth of God, which seeks in the context of time and growth into holiness, to love God in return. Theology, then, is a discipline which arises from the sanctified life. Theology exists underneath, for Wesley, the commandment of St. Paul, uh, which is given to the believers in Rome. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I hope you note my... Uh, a homage to my 1980s youth uh, with the image of transformation. Since theology belongs to the sphere of de facto sanctification of the creature in time, it proceeds from the life of faith of the one who is actively being regenerated, not only in soul and body, but also in the renewal of the mind, and who seeks actively to move within the movements of God's grace and to grow so as to have the same mind as was in Jesus Christ. The beginning of theology is the sanctifying work of God as God renews the mind of the believer, and the ends of theology rest in worship and glorification of God however strange that might seem to us when we're in the process, perhaps, of sitting a theology degree or writing a PhD. As a discipline of the sanctified mind pursued in humility for the glory of God, the ultimate ends of theology, like the ultimate ends of all creaturely existence, rest in divine adoration. That theology's telos is worship and adoration of God, 
places some appropriate limits, it seems to me, on theology's authority and the authority of the theologian. Theology can never have fully arrived or be complete any more than the life of the creature can be complete or finished in its worship or adoration of God or in its journey of holiness. Theology must always know that it has an eschatological limit case, the limit of the object to which it corresponds. The insights of theology, however seemingly important, must always bear the hallmarks of the proviso that rests in the glory of God, which the creature will need eternity to explore. Wolfhard Pannenberg, it seems to me, is right, therefore, to state the church's dogma, which is still on the way, cannot itself be the eschatological form of revealed truth. It always remains under the eschatological proviso, the sign of the not yet, which characterizes all Christian life and thought and operates within history in the revision of time-bound confessional formulations coined at some particular time. You can begin to see here with this language of proviso what some of the critical tasks of theology might possibly be uh, in relation to this. He states further, dogmatic speaks constantly of something that will truly appear only in a future which is inconceivable for us, but which has already happened in Jesus at a specific time. And it speaks of this in a language that necessarily lags infinitely behind the future reality of the resurrection life, because this new reality is precisely what we have not yet experienced, something which we can speak of only in a provisional and symbolic way on the basis of our quite different sort of experience of reality. The eschatological horizon of any theological statement cannot be forgotten. Theology journeys towards its end point, which is the eternal life of the redeemed. As St. Paul puts it famously, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. And even in the eschaton, the mind shall only begin to continue to progress towards God for all eternity, since the God we worship and participate in is infinite, a point that the Cappadocian fathers remind us of in their discussion of epectasis. In Anna Williams' words, the process of continual growth has no end because there is no end to the boundlessness of the divine. The ends of theological reason are an active and journeying contemplation, even if the starts of theological reason are practical in terms of the progressive sanctification, be transformed, that comes from the renewing of the creaturely mind as it moves within the grace that has moved it. That theology's ends are in the worship of God also places limits on the idea, it seems to me, of a particular status for the professional theologian who might be conceived as having some special relationship to some Gnostic secrets available only to those who have pursued intellectual study of the faith. The power and capacity of theology within the life of the church rest in theology's sanctified act of praise, worship, and adoration of God, and not in any particular special knowledge that theology may somehow claim to have. But otherwise, we might say that theology is indexed to worship and not, symmetrically at least, vice versa. Theology is indexed to worship and not, symmetrically at least, vice versa. Theology is the act of the worshipping mind and is not necessarily different in degree or in kind to any other mode of worship. It is instead simply that worship in which the regenerate mind engages with all of its critical faculties and attempts at engaging the intellect. Theology belongs, therefore, to the creaturely human participation proleptically in space and time, in the divine life and the ongoing work of redemption. The mind, according to St. Paul, is renewed so that you may discern what is the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect, Romans 12, 2. The purpose of theological inquiry and the renewed mind is to will what God wills, a practical reason, one might say for the sake of glorification of the divine life, which one might index to contemplation. For those of you who are cued into some of this, you might see that in the footnotes I'm having a quiet discussion with Thomas Aquinas going through, who sets up an either-or uh, between practical, and contempt, practical engagement and contemplation. I wanted to say that both of these exist together. Intellectual pursuit in theology is an aspect of sanctification 
And sanctification is an act of God to bring the creature in its free willing into conformity with God's willing. There is no necessary competition, therefore, between describing theology in relation to practical or pure or contemplative or speculative reason. The renewing of the mind, contemplation, arises from nonconformity to the world, practical. Proving the will of God, practical, arises from the renewing of the mind, contemplation. Both praxis and contemplation, um, uh, uh, sorry, both praxis and contemplation arise from praxis and contemplation chiastically in Romans 12.2. In her discussion of desire and theology, Sarah Coakley reflects some of this in pointing to theology's nature of being in weir, being on a journey into God. According to her, and I quote, what shifts on this view of theology is not merely the range of vision afforded over time by the interplay of theological investigation and ascetical practice, but the very capacity to see what is being progressively purged in undertaking, in the undertaking is the fallen and flawed capacity for idolatry, the tragic misdirecting of desire. One is learning over a lifetime and not without painful difficulty to think act, desire, and see right. This purging of desire so as to see God aright is the activity of sanctification in the believer under which theology's existence as the ordering and renewing of the mind may possibly be understood. The Spirit sanctifies the people of God and thereby renews the regenerate believer's mind to exercise that mind in relation to divine things. The location, then, of theology for Methodism, I want to say, is under the activity of the Spirit of God working within the believer's life to enable her to will and desire God and to learn ever more who God is, involving all of the critical engagement of the intellect that that might require. The activity of reasoning theologically is neither an activity uh, singularly of divine fiat nor one singularly of intellectual effort but an act of creaturely adoration and worship of the one who has moved the creature in her creaturely intellectual integrity and in whose grace the creature in her creaturely intellectual integrity seeks to move and exist. But otherwise it might be possible to say that it is not only the case that sanctification is the appropriate locus, at least from a Methodist perspective, for a theological account of the activity of theology, but that such an account might well help to address tensions that exist throughout the tradition in placing too strong an emphasis in theology on the role of created reason, such that only those with more intellectual ability might be considered to have access to the knowledge of God, and too strong a sense of the activity of the divine, such that theological statements are afforded too great or too realized an authority, separate from the limits of fallen creatureliness. And that such an account as well may well undermine false dichotomies between practical and speculative or contemplative reason. Well, having lost most of you as I've tried to describe what the creature is doing in engaging in theology, I want then to move to think about how this might be done. And you'll be glad to hear, if nothing else, that the rest of the sections are a bit briefer and a lot more straightforward to follow. The heavy lifting has been done. Having argued that theology is best understood under the doctrine of sanctification and thereby attempted to define theology's tasks, foundation, and endpoints, the question arises of how best the regenerate mind might think about the divine life and its ways with the world and therefore of what the sources the mind has, what sources the mind has to consider in relation to making theological statements. And it's to these sources that the paper now turns in addressing the Wesleyan quadrilateral. The idea of the Wesleyan quadrilateral has become so pervasive that it's almost no longer fittingly spoken of as Wesleyan. The idea that theology rests in its attention to scripture, tradition, reason, and experience is one which has become so normative for the student of theology, that its recognition as a distinctively Methodist way of doing theology has altogether been lost. It's true to say that the term quadrilateral doesn't belong to Wesley. What it is instead is a description by Albert Outler, perhaps the greatest ever Wesley scholar, of the way in which Wesley engaged in theology. 
But to say that somehow this isn't an appropriate term to use to describe theology seems to me a little bit akin to saying something like the fact that Spainer is the first person to coin the term priesthood of all believers means that that idea isn't present within Luther. It's certainly true that for Wesley, the data of theology, the authority on which theological statements rests, is fourfold. Although each of these components doesn't necessarily at all points have the same amount of authority. Theological statements rest on the coalescence of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And what is most particular, perhaps, for the theology of Wesley's own time is the final of those four categories, the role of experience, which is almost taken for granted, uh, and perhaps, if I was allowed a polemical moment, given too much authority, it seems to me, in much contemporary theological engagement. Uh, as an Anglican cleric, and I recognize some of my Episcopalian friends sat over here, as an Anglican cleric, Wesley would no doubt have been trained uh, in Hooker's approach to the theological tradition and indeed directly engages with Hooker. Uh, in distinction from some aspects of the European Reformation, for Hooker, along with natural law, scripture, reason, and tradition form the basis for theological statements and theological authority. What Wesley, with his emphasis on the transformed heart, does, and his emphasis on the ongoing nature of sanctification, considers, is whether it is appropriate to add the experiential in faith, the fides qua creditor, as a datum for objective claims of the faith, the fides qua creditor. The faith by which we believe with, for Wesley, with his emphasis on sanctification within the economy of God, becomes a contributory part of theological statements about the faith which is believed, and thereby experience becomes a theological source, a mode of theological data. Now, in the longer version uh, of this lecture, which you'll all be relieved I'm not giving this evening, I go on to expound each of these areas in relation to Wesley's own corpus, but as I said before, because of my concern not to cast too many Wesleyan uh, pearls before you, I want simply to uh, come to the conclusion of that section, which is to say that in describing the quadrilateral of sources and norms of theology, these four locations of theological data do not exist for Wesley as independent or, inter or, or unrelated or competitive sources of theological information. They exist rather always in relation to one another. Now, I'm going to temper my comments slightly because I'm being recorded uh, at the moment and this will be on YouTube, but I do have a great trouble with the idea that when people do theology, perhaps particularly from my own tradition, what they often do is have a section on what they think scripture says, usually not with any engagement with critical commentaries or thought or genuine biblical scholars, a bit like myself, um, then what they think tradition says, then uh, what they think reason might somehow say, as if reason were some independent category, and then they trump it all with the fact that, you know, how I feel about G Jesus on a Tuesday really triumphs over everything else. Uh, and these things are set in relation and competition to one another, and the task of the theologian is to pick one somehow. And you can, you know, the Catholics with a small c amongst the tradition will pick the tradition side, and the liberals will pick the critical side. Uh, you know, and the fundamentalists will pick the Bible side and the woolly people will all go towards experience, which from my own tradition is most people probably. Uh, but for Wesley, the point is not the competition between them. The point is the interaction between them. It's the point on this diagram here of where they meet in the middle. Um, Anna Williams, in what I think is an absolutely splendid book, points helpfully in this direction when she states, theological warrants, what I'm calling in this lecture the quadrilateral, do not stand on a par with each other. The claims of tradition, reason, and experience to the states of freestanding warrants are exceedingly weak. They serve as interpreters of scripture rather than as autonomous alternatives to it. The claim of scripture to be the sole warrant, she says, is equally implausible, however. William's discussion helpfully identifies the relationality of the different components of the quadrilateral to each other, though in her account, discussion is primary about, primarily about the relationship of scripture to other sources of theological data. But nevertheless, the concerns that she expresses here are concerns that we can see within Wesley himself. But what if we might take this matter a little further? 
As Williams makes clear in her argument, the warrants of theology, as she calls them, the components of the quadrilateral resist being authorities in and of themselves because they are radically interpenetrable. They do not function to provide endpoints to theological discussion, but starting points as sources. And the interpretation of each of them rests in each which is relation to the other by and through which their interpretation will be made possible. So it's taking this a step further that I want to look at in the rest of the lecture, and I recognize that I'm going somewhat over time, so I may well try and summarize as we go through um, the interrelation of sources, thirdly. I guess what I'm wanting to say is that within Methodist theology, what we shouldn't do is to think of independent sources each existing by themselves and then coming to some synoptic judgment some, from some view above them all in relation to which one might uh, trump the day going through. Instead of thinking about um, four distinct components, I think we have to think about four sides to one square. Or perhaps, if I can stretch your uh, geometrical imaginations a little bit further, perhaps we need to move from thinking about quadrilaterals to hexadecahedrons. Uh, and I was very impressed that I could still remember that 20-odd uh, years uh, later than the last time I studied any mathematics. An expression of the sources and norms of theology as variously interrelated to one another in complex and multidimensional ways. There seems to me a need uh, in theological method for Methodists to consider in more lively uh, and dynamic and interrelated ways the four sources of theology and the way in which they relate internal to themselves, the way in which they relate in relation to each other, and the way in which they relate in relation to the loci of theology, the different topics of theology which have to be related to each other. Well, in the, last bit of, in the remainder of this lecture, what I want to do is to explore these three distinct levels. So let's begin by looking at the primary level of the source itself. It seems to me that no one source of theology can ever be understood even in and of itself, internal to itself, without thinking about the other three. So let us take the example of Scripture. Scripture is an example which contains in itself reasoned in that it is written in meaningful language and on occasion engages in arguments of different form. It also contains narration and poetry. It is written in reasoned, uh, it's a, it is a reasoned account of the experience of God by God's people and in internal conversations it has with itself, in its own process perhaps even of redaction, uh, we can see that there is engagement with earlier theological traditions. There is tradition internal to it. You can do the same with each one. Reason does not exist by itself, but as the means by which tradition, experience, and scripture express themselves to enable the theologian to penetrate the meaning that they contain. Or further, tradition rests on interpretation of scripture through reasoning about it in the context of lived experience within the church. And still further, experience um, <coughs> is the context in which scripture is heard and related to the life of the believer who reflects uh, Re rationally and critically upon the life of faith in relation to the tradition and the scriptures it has received. So internal to each one of the sources is the other sources within itself. And they can be variously construed in different hierarchies, differently emphasized, we might think, as we go through. However, at a secondary level, what we can also say is that when we take each of those four uh, sources of authority, each of those warrants of theology, they can be construed in relation to each other in multiple and manifold distinctive ways. So at a secondary level, the sources are interrelated in the theological task as the mind seeks through its renewing to reflect upon God and God's ways with the world in the complex interrelations that they have with each other. So let's just work through one example of what I'm trying to say here. So even if we took scripture as a starting point, we might say that scripture is not thought of without thinking of the inherited hearing of the church in its tradition, which is related through critical reasoning to the present life of the community or the individual's hearing of the word of God in its experience of the witness of the spirit in the here and now experience. However, even this doesn't fully capture some of the intense complexity that we can have 
by starting even with scripture and rearranging 2, 3, and 4 in different ways as we go through. Let me try and show you what I mean. And perhaps that's a better illustration than me attempting to read it all out. Um, let me just take the first um, uh, two to give you a sense of what we, what we can have. We can think of scripture in relation to reasoning, in relation to experience, in relation to traditional teaching. And when we think that way, we're going to produce a slightly different account or a different way of thinking about scripture when we think about scripture refracted through reasoning, then tradition, then experience, and so on and so forth. As we give distinctive shifting hierarchies, distinctive levels of authority to the different components and warrants of theology, we're going to produce interestingly distinctive ways of describing different theological loci and topics. All of these different arrangements will produce, therefore, different theological descriptions which cannot be reduced to any simple, single, overarching approach or reduced to a singular essence. This complex multi-relationality, I might want to say, is then multiplied to the power of four because we can start with any one of those four different warrants of theology. So we could begin with either experience or tradition or reason and similarly engage in an exercise like that. And as we think about each of them, each of them internally has a fourfold distinctive hierarchical sense within it because there are different aspects of it that we might reflect on or think about. So thinking about scripture, for example, from the perspective of the way in which it's inherited might place a greater degree of emphasis on, say, something like uh, reader response ideas or, or traditions of inheritance or tradition than it might do thinking about it from the perspective of critical engagement with it or even thinking about it um, from the perspective of tradition in relation to um, uh, uh, critical rational reflection might produce a distinctive set of emphases which look at redactions, which look at forms of text, which look at the evolution of the text, the internal traditions, if you like, within the text, distinct different people thinking about it from the perspective of theology and so on and so forth. The same topic, therefore, can be explored in a manifold set of ways. This kind of approach, it seems to me, um, is one which, although it seems to be intensely complex, is appropriate for the very object on which theology reflects. The words of the Anglican theologian, the late Daniel Hardy, uh, one of the people who influenced me the most, uh, seem wise. The increasing complexity is itself manifestation of the ongoing energetic involvement and participation of God, whereby God intends to move towards fuller and fuller relationship with God's people. In de facto sanctification, the believer moves towards God who moves towards ever fuller relationship with creation. Or as my refrain went uh, earlier, moved by grace, the believer moves intellectually within grace, within all of its infinite complexity, all of its manifoldness, because it is the grace which seeks to describe God who is beyond human imaginings and imagination. What it seems to me that this means, therefore, is that the attitude of the theologian shouldn't be an attitude in which theological statements harden and crystallize, where it is always a case of saying, I am right and you are wrong, where it's always a set of choices between either and or, but should instead be one which reflects, in fact, the mind which is being renewed and transformed, the mind which is being sanctified. That in light of the complexity of the object, there should be a recognition of the need for humility in theological speech. Uh, the statement, it seems to me, that God is simple is perhaps one of the most complex statements that we can ever make. Uh, and it is a statement which we must make in humility, recognizing that in the complexity of exploring this immeasurably large topic, we will never arrive at the final answer and there will always be infinitely more to explain. The attitude of the theologian, therefore, might well best be described as an attitude of patience, of forbearance, of self-control, of humility. Well, does this mean that the task of systematicity is an altogether lost one? This leads me to my final set of comments in the last few minutes. Well, I want to say no, because alongside these first two levels of interrelation is a third level where the theologian has to reflect upon each locus of Christian theology in relation to every other locus of theology. 
The reason for this, however, is not simply, not simply because of the requirement on the level of reason to engage in coherence, but I would want to say is also, and perhaps more foundationally, the fact that God is one. I'm very nervous seeing our professor, uh, our established professor of Hebrew sat in, uh, in our presence to mention anything to do with the Old Testament at all. But it seems to me that it is very significant that the Shema uh, has become a, a refrain within Jewish worship liturgy, within Jewish day-to-day -day life. Uh, it's something that we do not yet know. That seems to me part of the reason behind it, that we are all of us, all of the time, um, uh, tempted towards the idea of uh, po uh, polytheism, that we're tempted to think about God in a fragmentary way, rather than being reminded that God is one. The task of systematicity, it seems to me, rests in that attempt at reflecting upon the fact that God is one. Systematicity is a necessary aspect of the theological task, not in the first place because of the demands and expectations of human reason, but because of who God is. And so it is not wise to understand systematicity as some kind of reductive enterprise engaged in identifying an essence to Christianity, but as the attempt at the sanctified mind, the mind which seeks to correspond to the object uh, who has loved it with grace, to reflect upon that object uh, of God who is one. Thinking of theology in relation to sanctification might help us uh, once again here to contemplate the way in which we understand theology not as uh, a set uh, amount of data which is somehow inherited in some hardened and crystallized form, but is instead a movement within the movements of grace. And within the movements of grace, there are manifold and multiple ways in which we might move, I would want to say. Systematicity matters, therefore, but it matters in relation to the renewed mind's movement within grace in a manner which desires to be coherent and consistent and to remember the reality that God is one. There is always, therefore, provisionality about any system that we think about, all kinds of different ways in which you can imagine interrelating them. And that provisionality relates not only to creaturely limits, but to the complexity and ineffability of the object that the theologian seeks to reflect upon. As our late colleague John Webster writes, the assumption that there is no systematic intellectual virtues, only intellectual vices, betrays lazy trust in the indeterminacy to deliver the mind from folly. Excessive systematic pretension is most effectively arrested by dogmatic rules. God's life is infinitely abundant, and we are not yet fully the friends of God. A theological system is no more than one staging post on the mind's ascent to paradise. These different provisional and reformable systematic attempts arise from the different order and different interrelation of the four main theological sources, the orderings and different interrelations of which create manifold but not necessarily competitive irreducible theological narratives. This non-competition is not at the level of the capacity to say opposing things without any sense of theological commitment to the correctness of them or without any investment in intellectual coherence. Non-competitiveness exists rather at the level of saying that there is vast, a vast multiplicity of systematic arrangements of the articles of the faith which can be approached through multiple different interrelations of theological orderings of the sources as they themselves multiply internally related can be engaged with each other. This approach need not, however, create a theology which is fragmentary, but one, I would want to say, which is fractal and driven by recursion, with a dynamic series of never-ending patterns which go on infinitely in relation to the infinity and simplicity of the one God. As the theologian learns to describe these recursive fractal, fractals of theological material, the theologian will learn to use terminology borrowed from David Kelsey, different theological narrative logics which cannot be collapsed into each other. These will be the narrative logics which are related to one another in distinctive orderings as a result of this vast complexity of the threefold orderings of different accounts 
of the interrelation of sources. To conclude very briefly, Methodists often say that we sing our doctrines. Uh, it seems to me that there's an appropriateness about that, not only because of the richness of the hymnodic tradition that Methodism possesses, but because music gives us a glimpse at something of the capacity for there to be non-competitive relations, for there to be harmony, counterpoint, discord, moments of diminuendo, crescendo, moments where it is piano or fortissimo, moments even of dissonance within the orchestration. It, it seems to me that it might be wise for us to imagine if we are thinking about theology as existing within the sanctifying grace of God within creation as an exercise of the renewed mind attempting with its intellect to sing that unending hymn of praise, holy, 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 the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. I freestyled through the second half of that lecture, which I hope uh, made some sense nevertheless as we went through. Uh, but I'm very grateful for your attention uh, on this autumn evening. Thank you very much. I think we've got about five or so minutes uh, for questions, if anybody would, if anybody is still awake. There is a button that says speak as well, if you, uh, if you desire it. I can see one here. That was a tour de force. Thank you very, very much for, for what you've presented today. Absolutely magnificent. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Andrew, I think you've... Uh, thanks very much, Tom. In um, a question about how theology as, a form, as, as located within sanctification, how that relates to the teaching offices of the church. So my question is, is really, uh, I want to press you a little on whether locating theology within sanctification, uh, what that means for the different giftedness of people within the church. You, met, you mentioned people who are differently abled um, but even even before you get to that, I think there's a question to be asked about what what kind of intellectual work is necessary for sanctification, and um, why why should we expect different people to be kind of equipped for this work? Can you, can you just help me out in relation to that? Where, where would you locate the teaching office if not in sanctifying grace? I'm just not working. I'm really just wanting you to comment on um, how what you're saying about theology as located within sanctification. Does th what does this mean for for everyone? And what's the what's the logic of the kind of mediation of 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 theological truth to you know different people in the community? Okay. So if I've understood you, understood you right, I think I, I think what I'd want. I think I'd probably want to look to Luther um, and the, the priestly capacity of all Christians to teach one another, uh, that, that priesthood relates for Luther to the capacity to speak the word of God to one another uh, and to pray for each other. But that, that doesn't necessarily, although there's no uh, absolute distinction between the two, it doesn't mean that everybody is called to a particular public teaching office. And I, so I think I'd want to see it as a both and. It probably comes back to this issue of where you index that asymmetrical relationship between um, worship and theology. If you index theology underneath um, the engagement in worship that the sanctified mind actively engages in, then it's a universal engagement. We might want to say everybody somehow might teach us something about uh, the nature of the faith. But public um, offices, I want to say, is a distinctive thing is, is, a, is a functionary thing. I mean, it's very interesting that you put your finger on that. I mean, part, part of my whole project at the moment is to try to get away from talking all the time about the clergy when we talk about the church. Um, and and that, it's, it fascinates me that even in work not to do with the church, that, that a component of that shines through. But we, I think it's in one of those places where it's not an either or condition. And clearly there are people 
who are going to have particular gifts or fittingnesses or whatever language that you want to use to engage in intellectual inquiry into the faith. And they have a particular task. And within a broader uh, e economy or ecology, we might want to say, that they have distinctive roles to play for the sake of the whole body. The question is that, that we don't become we don't recognize some kind of distinction by degree isn't even quite the right word, some distinction by office as being a, a distinction in kind. Okay. Probably our last question. <laughs> no, I was just stuck with the, the tide, the imagery of tide and living close to River D and observing the tide going up and down, um, especially during the new moon. Um, I'm mindful that the fish can go along with the tide much better than me trying to get either close to the river or to the sea. Uh, do you want to say that anywhere further? That's, um, I, I think that's a beautiful image. But <laughs> There is the, the identity of, not, not just the identity, the being um, in, it, it, for us to move in the tide of God's reality, um, it seems that the fish has a better chance than uh, a human being. Than the observer, maybe yeah. going. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting question about what, and I think I'd want to say that there's a it's a both and, but it's an interesting question about what what we do in theology. Do we participate in the church's speech within the life of faith, recognizing the location that we have, or do we observe it out with and describe what we're seeing between the two. And I think I want to say there's got to be a place for both of those perspectives going through. Uh, but certainly, uh, if you're wanting to somehow, you know, given that this is a Christ College lecture and we're thinking about the relationship between the church and the academy, uh, or the church and theology, if you're wanting to think about the role of theology within the life of the church, then being a participant, even if a participant observer seems um, wise. And one thought I did have when I was preparing this is, is whether there might even be a sense in which we could say that there are anonymous theologians, a bit like Rana says there are anonymous Christians, that even those who don't think that they are within and, and nevertheless give us theological data are, are within because the ways, God's ways with the world are manifold and beyond expression or imagination. But thank you for the image. Okay. I think I probably ought to let you all um, escape to whatever more interesting thing you have on this evening. I know that there's a wonderful Bach um, concert taking place uh, in the chapel um, shortly. So if you're off to that, that's probably a far better way of trying to understand something to do with the Reformation than anything uh, from my own mouth. Thank you very much for all of your patience. Thank you.